All right. Um, I believe that closed captioning should be enabled for you. Um, if someone is here that needs some assistance, do let me know. Um, if you have any questions, you can always use the chat box for any questions or the Q&A for any dedicated questions, and I'll be able to attend them as soon as I can or at the end of this call. So um, this is the first webinar that we're doing for, for Singapore um, in, in the last four years. So I'm really excited about that. We've named it on purposely, OK, La, let's get Singapore ready for better web accessibility. Um, I we thought that would be a really um, good catchphrase for a title. So um, as I mentioned, I'm really excited to, um, to go through all of the different landscapes. But today's agenda, we're going to cover three main topics. What is web accessibility? Um, and also go through the master plan for 2030 that was developed by MSF and other organizations to, um, to help people with disabilities to be more inclusive. How inclusive. And, and also there are some recommendations that I'm going to be walking you through. And then the third one would be going um, to get you ready for actual um, projects and how we can um, manage risk and cost to accessibility and digital inclusivity. Now, today, um, I'm going to make the argument that government and public serving websites should focus on making their website more accessible and inclusive. And there are many reasons to do that. But here are the three main reasons. Because um, first of all, your website is your digital information hub. And you know, people want to transact with their government agencies online. They don't necessarily want to come into the government building, especially not when it's closed. Um, let's say on weekends or on um, the times when it was COVID, everything was closed. So um, that's why we're forced to kind of go online. Um, so that digital transformation or information hub should be always open and available. Secondly, it's your number one visited assets. Um, you know, we have parks and buildings and theme parks and shops. They're all accessible and inclusive, but the reality is that your website is really your number one visited asset. And for the community, it's really important that you should make um, the focus on making the website accessible, inclusive for all people. Last but not least, it's the source of truth. Um, if something on the website is published and it is treated as the voice of your organization, so that's where people go for information. And if something, or that information is inaccurate, it kind of creates some sort of distrust in government, which we, we obviously don't want to have. So what is web accessibility? It, I'm sure you've heard it before. If you haven't heard it before, that's completely OK. Um, it's not something very easy to explain. It's a very broad topic. Um, but I kind of wanted to start with some stats. And these are um, from N MSF and NCSS in Singapore. Um, here are some stats about how many people are affected by disabilities. Um, it's 2.1% of the student population in Singapore. That's 3.4% of the resident population between 18 year olds to 49 year olds. And it's 13.3% of resident population who are 50 years older and above. And it's the, the I guess the, the division here is that people with sensory disabilities, those that are blind, those that are deaf, um, and other physical disabilities, they are pretty much constituting for half of the disability group, and the other half can be then. Um, divided into people with intellectual disabilities, autism spectrum disorder, and, and other types of disabilities that I'm going to walk you through. Now, here we have a few types of disabilities. There's actually five main ones, and, and um, just wanted to, to go through. And the first one is visual, which includes blindness, um, low vision, and color blindness. And we have hearing disabilities, including hearing impairments and deafness. Cognitive disabilities, they basically include anyone who's having learning disabilities, um, any dyslexia, potential lack of focus, attention, and potentially logic as well. Motor disabilities is, is when someone is not able to use their motor skills, including muscle slowness, um, difficulty, or complete inability to use hands. And then we have neurological disabilities. These are involving the central and peripheral nervous systems, such as epilepsy, Alzheimer's, and Parkinson's disease. 
With that said, though, in reality, we need to just think beyond the permanent disability because there are other impairments, situational limitations. Um, we've had a marketing team member who had a, a really terrible eye infection. It was pretty terrible. Um, she had to deploy the use of assistive technology, use her phone more, and to do many tasks that she normally would to continue working. I myself was on holiday in Thailand a few weeks ago, and I had an arm injury, my hand injury, and I wasn't able to use my right hand to use a mouse or to use my keyboard at all. So I um, found a, a voice-to-text um, assistive technology where I would basically command um, with my voice on what I wanted to do. And, and guess what? It wasn't easy at all. Um, a, lot of the, a lot of the times it wouldn't even do what I wanted to do, like scroll down to the next page or to the to the below. So um, we definitely shouldn't discriminate against those um, temporary disabilities as well. Now, you may want to think like, how does that translate into web accessibility? So um, typically, for those that, that you know, um, web accessibility standards have been uh, basically um, used as guidelines and, and prescribed as guidelines by a consortium called W3C. And it's oftentimes called WCAG, WCAG, or Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. And here are some of the examples that I'm going to translate what that means, um, what you need to do for your website. So for someone who has visual disability, including blindness, low vision, and color blindness, we would, for example, say we need to add an alternate text to all of our images, or simply an alt text. Basically, anytime you use an image or an arrow or a logo or a home button or a CTA button, it needs to have a short description of what the image is about so that the screen reader can read it out loud for someone who is blind because they cannot see what's depicted on the image. For hearing disabilities, so obviously um, someone who has um, deafness or a hearing impairment, we would obviously want to make sure that there's this group information about any tabs, any forms, anything that is in a PDF format or anything that they would need to fill in or navigate through on your website. There should be a description, again, for a screen reader to read it out loud or for them to be able to kind of um, use other assistive technology to be able to understand what's being described. For cognitive disabilities, um, those are ones with learning disabilities and logic. We could use um, something um, in terms of, you know, if they have difficulty reading or focusing on a particular topic is to focus on readability and make sure that we use um, shorter sentences, that we use bullet points uh, to make sure that it's much easier uh, for them to, to, sk to skim through the content and to be able to retain the con content as well. So um, that, that's how it translates to making um, it accessible for them. For those that have motor disabilities, can't use their hands, um, keyboard navigation is, is a really great one. So we want to make sure that your website and all of your content is um, easy to navigate from a keyboard, um, such as skipping tabs, skipping certain elements, skipping certain content that they may not be interested in, and actually bringing them to where they are looking for that particular information across your entire page. For neurological disabilities, again, there are some assistive technologies available for those people who have peripheral nervous systems and disorders. Um, that, that will be probably the most uh, difficult one to tackle. But um, again, there are multiple um, technologies available for those specific uh, people with disabilities, including pens, including um, screen readers, including any additional specific tools that they can use. Right, now that we talked about this, let's talk about the actual plans and, and what it's going to be to uh, part of the master plan for 2030. So these master plans, they have been, they have existed before. There's four of them that existed before. They're basically national roadmaps for the government and the community in its entirety to work together and support all the people with disabilities. It's basically a goal to create a care and inclusive Singapore and people need to be, people with disability need to be recognized um, 
is equal and empowered to be integral and contributing members of the society. Um, you, if you're interested, a full 2030 report can be found on MSF's website, and it covers about 29 recommendations about and three strategic scheme themes. Um, not going to go through all of them, but um, if you're really interested how the future of the disability landscape will look like, um, feel free to download the uh, the full report. I'm also more than happy to send it out to you. So one of, or I guess a few of these recommendations that I kind of want to talk through that are pretty relevant to web accessibility specifically is, for example, having um, alternative employment models. That means that there's, you know, micro jobs for persons with disabilities that government agencies can create to include them um, and also kind of involve them in in um, web accessibility as well. So we can also look at um, increasing the number of disability inclusive employers. Um, we could also help um, people with disabilities by using subtitles, captions, and sign language interpretations for any videos that we post, for any education purposes or training purposes, or in general, just even um, any learning materials or collateral that we publish on our um, on our website and that would help them to guide them through to how to apply for a particular new policy or how to lodge their tax or um, how they could get a career with you guys so if we have these uh, um, additional things like captions and subtitles and sign language that would help them a lot and for them to be a bit connect them together with your organization and one of them also 100% of all high traffic government websites should be accessible by 2030. I know that's a very long time to go still. However, there's a few things that you can do from now on and, and get ready by that time. Um, there are a lot of them that have already kind of started thinking about what that landscape will look like. But so far, um, this, is, this is the stats that we were given by, by MSF. Um, these are a few of those recommendations that I think were quite relevant to web accessibility and how we can do this. And going back to you know, the employment, I just wanted to, to talk about looking at this graph that we have 66.2% that are outside of the labor force. And, and that's a lot, that's a big portion that we see that they are outside of the labor force. Why not include them to help with your accessibility projects? Why not help them to create a better experience for similar visitors? Um, at Monsito, we have someone with, uh, someone, a colleague who has uh, visual impairments. He helps us to make websites better. He makes, he helps us to make your websites better. He's testing them himself and providing the consultancy and the recommendations. Um, where we could help our customers and um, our own website, for example. So people also should be able to apply for jobs with an accessible website. So if you do have a career section, make sure that it is accessible because that will help them, uh, people with, with disabilities to, to be able to go through that process and not be discriminated against. Now there's obviously with, with all of that, I mean, the topic of accessibility has been around for a very long time, um, at least in, you know, in the US and in Australia and the UK. I believe it's pretty new for Singapore and any other uh, markets that um, I particularly found very difficult to, to kind of spread the word about it. But there's also misconceptions, right? And one common one is that people think that, you know, my CMS does it all. And Unfortunately, that's not the case. Um, your web provider may provide you a template that is accessible, but any content that goes on, on, on it, that's your responsibility. But basically anything you post, something new on the website, you are now responsible to make that accessible. And over the years, um, you know, any approach is a good approach. That's not the case. Over the years, there's many, many new accessibility technologies that have been popping up. Um, do your own research because at the end of the day, and not some of those companies are not accepted by the accessibility community. There's a bunch of forums where um, they may be complaining about those that they actually don't help at all. So um, yeah, make sure that you do your research um, before you actually choose a, a platform. Now, I want to talk more about how do we actually move move to this 
and make it more actionable and make it into a project? How do we take all of this and bring it to accessibility and digital inclusivity as a project? Um, first of all, when you kind of break down the core function of your website, first of all, it should be able to be accessed, right? And once it's accessed, it needs to be navigated. And lastly, it needs to be understood. And when you think about it, by having a website that can be accessed, navigated, understood, more than just, you know, it's not just for, for everyone. It's, it, it's needed for, for the disabled community to be, to be benefiting from. So everyone's benefiting from this because um, even your staff, they wouldn't necessarily have to deal with customer calls, customer emails, because people simply cannot find the information that they're looking for on your website. And obviously the last thing that I kind of wanted to walk you through today is a few screenshots of how Mancito can actually help you uh, with a few of those things. Um, first of all, um, you know, can your website be accessed? Um, this is nothing worse when the website isn't working, I guess. So, um, you know, what if it's what if it's not loading? So there's, I mean, obviously, um, that's the first thing that that we need to make sure that it uh, that it works and that it's loading. Um, you know, when your website is goes down, so do you ever get notified? I mean, um, you've seen what we've seen is that your host provider maybe or your IT team has some planned downtime or scheduled downtime, but what if the site unexpectedly goes down? And how would you know? So that is something that we also need to track and make sure that the website is always up and running. Can it be navigated? Um, we see this a lot where there's a lot of broken links, um, especially in the government space, because you are all linking each other, each other's websites, each other's collateral information, uh, because it's all kind of intertwined, right? And um, I see this a lot where um, one government agency decides to change a whole website and the whole sitemap, so it's not available anymore. So that's a problem when we link to external links or even internal links ourselves. So, and the broken links mean that the journey is interrupted for those visitors. They're not able to find what they're looking for, and this is not ideal. This is not something we want to have. Um, and that's how uh, Monsito can also help with getting through all of these broken links and be notified about them. Now we talk about the actual WCAG compliance. You've heard me talk in the first uh, part of this webinar about web accessibility. Now, how do we translate that into um, actually going and fixing it? So uh, what we'll do is we basically um, will, we've imported all of the guidelines according to the WCAG and W3C consortium. We will have all of the issues in there. It's not something that one team has to go and fix the collaborative effort. Um, there are some different levels of, of compliance to hit. It's always a work in progress, continuous project. And by no means can you go and have 100% compliance. And um, that's not what we're trying to say either. It's actually never likely to, to happen to have 100% compliance because as content gets added to your website, I mean, you're bound to fail some of those compliance level checks that's that's almost certain what's most important is that what and you know what what visitors want to see what users want to see is that you're actually making an effort and you can do that by identifying the errors making the fixes as much as you can um, and that's why a regular audit a regular scan of those uh, would be great to have always at the top of your list um, to fix all of the issues that matter the most and work towards a more accessible website. Another way of, of, of accessibility, and I think that comes with those that have some learning disabilities or those who are not traditionally, I guess, the fastest readers. Um, readability comes in uh, to use because it not everyone may have a, a re readability level of a college graduate or even a college level. For government agencies, um, best practices and benchmarks is from ninth, uh, eight to ninth grade, 10 to 12th grade is what they sh should be sitting on. And it's not always has to do with terminology, but more about um, 
what uh, sentence structures you use, how long your paragraphs are, um, whether you just copy and paste 5,000 words on a page and that's it, you know, expecting people to read through all of that and be able to digest it. Um, for those that have dyslexia, for those that where English is not their first language, it might be a little bit difficult to, to read through all of this and digest all of this information. And if it's not accessible, then we don't have a chance that someone will be able to skip through some of that and navigate to the, to the exact paragraph that they're looking for or skipping immediately to the action button to reach out to you guys. So that is all very important as well. Um, I mean, last thing, one of the items is misspelling as well. I mean, similar how you can flag broken links or accessibility issues, we do um, scan for misspellings. Um, not only are they a little bit embarrassing, um, but if you do have a lower uh, level of, of English or uh, reading level, it can be a little bit disrupting as well for the understanding of the content of the page. And with the policies, um, this, this really has to do with um, basically setting up rules for um, any offensive language. So if you want, want your content to be more inclusive and uh, friendly towards people with disabilities, there, there are specific gender specific context policies where we could say, are, are we using uh, the right pronouns? Are we using, are we being inclusive towards people with disabilities? We aren't able to use certain words to call people of disabilities, including offensive language, including um, people, um, you know, that are, for example, in a wheelchair, there's a number of sentences and words that we shouldn't be using. Maybe not using the word senile, for example, but more uh, senior, that would be great. Um, and yeah, there's, there's a few, a few things that where we could en enforce this on our team by educating them, making sure that we also automatically track any of this um, offensive language um, and make sure that we use inclusive language instead. So ideally, I mean, the, the first thing that, that we could do is, is obviously spread, spread the word around what web accessibility is and the context of it and what it means for our agency or um, our public service agency to, um, to go through this project. Um, we, I mean, obviously, um, getting teams trained on digital accessibility, why it's important is the first step that we will have to do is to gather um, a group of champions that would like to tackle this together with us. Um, build content, when you build content with accessibility, it has to be from the start. So it needs to be in mind um, from the get-go when you start building out that new content in the future. Um, regularly scan your website and prioritize the most important issues. Um, that, as I mentioned, you can't make it 100% accessible. So prioritization comes in really handy, um, knowing what your highest traffic pages are to then um, tackle those first. And then anything that comes after would be, um, would be something that we could move out to another time. Um, manually audit the website and regular to find the rest. There are some accessibility issues that may not necessarily be confirmed. Uh, what I mean by that is that there's sometimes um, a team required to understand if it's, um, if it's affecting the user experience. If you make your website fully accessible, you're going to end up with a very ugly looking website. So ideally, you would like to make sure that you don't compromise the user experience, the design of your website against those accessibility issues. And including an accessibility statement would be great on your website because then, you know, there will be a a feedback or a, a, maybe um, a questionnaire or uh, maybe just an empty form for people to leave their feedback and recommendations on what issues they may find, what is not accessible for them, whether they can't find something. Um, that was um, what I kind of wanted to walk you through today. Um, I was wondering if anyone has any questions for me. Um, 